All right, let's move out to, from the neighborhood to the to the kind of your regular routines in life. Um, one thing that Erica has has done, and I've learned from her, is she visits the same cashiers uh, at the grocery store. Is anyone in here a cashier, by the way, at anywhere around here? Okay. Um, I was going to say, if so, you're probably going to hear the gospel from me at some point because um, I just feel like that is a captive audience. Um, they are having to stand there. They cannot go anywhere. It is their job to listen to you and act happy about it. So um, I have always taken advantage of that as just an opportunity. That's the Lord saying you have an opportunity. I mean, you're standing here for 10 minutes. So um, I have really, this time, um, we have made kind of our, our, I've made kind of my mission field, my cashier ministry um, at Super Walmart and Neighborhood Walmart. And I know like all the names of all the people. And um, I've really gotten to know some of their stories and been able to just ask questions about that. And I told David just this past week, I met this girl and I was like, I'm going to invite her. Like, I, I want to come, I want her to come in our home. But last, a couple times ago, we were in the States and we were actually living on 69 South um, at the Gilgal Mission House. And um, we decided at that point, just as we were praying, where our mission field's going to be while we're in the States, we decided Publix Grocery Store and Super Walmart on Skyland were going to be kind of our mission fields. And so um, what I did is every time I went into Publix, um, and this is what I still do at these um, Super Walmart and the neighborhood Walmart, I look for the same people. And I would look for these same people um, at the deli, or I would look for the same people at the cash register, and I would just go to them and talk to them, or I'd wait in line until I could get to that person. And so um, one of the first times I went to Publix, I met a girl named Christavia. Um, she um, was very different from me, had a very different upbringing. She lived on MLK Junior Boulevard on the west side of town and had a very hard um, life and a rough upbringing. Um, but I had I just I just said, okay, you're you're my person today. And so um, I began a conversation with her that first day. We talked about kids. She had a few, and um, we talked about um, husbands. She had a boyfriend, and we just kind of talked through a lot of those different things. And then I went home, and then um, and you know put my groceries at home. And then the next time I went back to the grocery store, maybe I'm just like purposely picking up a couple of items, and I look for her again. And I've just continued that conversation with her. And then one day I went and I said, Christavia, I'm making chili tonight. Do you like chili? I think I remember you saying you did. And she was like, I do. And I said, would you like to come and bring your kids and your boyfriend over um, for chili? And she was like, okay. So they came to our home that night and they came in our home and our kids loved on their little baby and, um, and their little daughter was there with us. And um, we had a wonderful time engaging people that otherwise would never have been in our home. And I probably would not have been able to meet in, a, in my workplace or school or anything like that. Just such a different walk of life. But it was just a normal thing just to have that conversation and then just to say, hey, you want to come and join us and just see what our lives are like and let us see you and just um, and just be here for you. And so um, that is still happening. Uh, actually, just at the neighborhood Walmart just the other night, um, I was just asking a lady, um, how much longer you got tonight? And she said, whoo, I'm going to be here till nine. I said, oh, you got people waiting on you to cook for them when you get home, cook dinner. And she said, um, she said, yeah, actually, my daughter is home. And she began to talk about this story about her daughter. And she told me and um, all about her health issues that she's facing and um, lots of different things going on in her daughter's life and how that was a, a real burden for her because her husband had passed away and now she's carrying all of that burden. And so I said, you know what? This might be awkward for you or the people in line, but I don't care. Before the Lord, I'm going to pray for you right now because this is what's on my heart. So we just stopped right there at Walmart and prayed for her daughter. And she was like, thank you. And I think that's what we do. We just step in. We just engage. We just have a conversation. We as women have 60,000 words a day. Let's give some of them to the cashiers. <laughs> Let's give some of them to the people that we're, that we're seeing often. And I say that to say, go and look for the same people over and over and over, because eventually they're going to be comfortable enough with you for you to be able to invite them in their home, and they're going to say yes. So it's a great opportunity. I heard that husband say amen to the wife giving those 60,000 words to the <laughs> cashier instead of to him. I understand. I am really the most introverted person in this room, so I completely understand what you're saying there. Meet the people at a coffee shop. Um, this, is, th this is really the thing about intentionality. There's not, not anything um, magical about coffee, although I, I do love coffee. Um, but for, for me, I, I realize even the tr not, not, just, m not just making the discipline of leaving my home or my office to work where nonbelievers live and work, 
but which one do I go to? You know, there, there are some coffee shops that are very Christian, right? Uh, especially in Tuscaloosa in the South. And there are some coffee shops that are very much not Christian. If I have a choice, am I going to the Christian coffee shop or am I going to the non-Christian coffee shop? I'm going to go to the non-Christian coffee shop because that's where the, the places are where I'm going to enter into those redemptive conversations. I want to back up because it's relevant to the month that we're in now. Uh, on the last slide, we talked about um, taking advantage of the holidays. We are at that magic time of the year now where we've got three big Amer uh, American holidays coming up. you got Halloween, Thanksgiving, and Christmas back to back. This should be the givings. This should be the easiest time of year for you to engage in mission. So, for example, at Halloween, uh, October, the end of October is uh, coming up in a month. This is the time where you're, you should already be, you could also already be thinking about how am I going to use this opportunity as uh, th this, uh, this holiday as an opportunity to engage my neighbors. I was just laughing because we had this conversation around the table like, how could we like stand at the door and like, should we give them tracks? Like, and I was like, oh, maybe we can give them like little like candies. And when you open the wrapper, it's like some gospel presentation. Like I was like, how can we like get the gospel out right. of the candy? Yes. On Halloween? So I'm thinking already for uh, in Biscayne Hills in that neighborhood, you know, I'm thinking, okay, first of all, today when we were this afternoon, when we were out walk, doing our, my, my walk with the kids, I was thinking if I, if anyone's out, I'm just going to ask them, is, is this a neighborhood that kids usually trick or treat in? And um, just said, we, we're new in the neighborhood, but our kids would love to trick or treat. And, um, and if, if it's not, could we go around the neighborhood and, I mean, talk with Erica about this. This is today's epiphany. Could we go around the neighborhood and invite people to come out of their homes to our house and, we'll, and just say, I don't know if this is normally a trick or treating neighborhood, but we would love to give your kids candy. Mm -hmm. It's a natural way for us to go around the neighborhood. Right now, I'm, I'm kind of drawing a blank. Like, how can I get these people out of their homes? How can I get them to open the door? without, you know, wanting to shoot me or call the police. But if I show up with my kid and, and I say, hey, we just want to invite you to come to our house for trick-or-treating next week. You know, it's just being intentional, thinking like a missionary every day in everyday think, um, rhythms of life. Um, and that's going to be hard. I, I'll tell you, it's going to be hard for you here because usually as in the Christian culture in the South, instead of engaging non-Christian um, ho holidays or non-Christian, uh, Christian, sorry, non-Christian um, traditions, we usually pull away and separate from them. So I, I say that not having any idea what Northport's plans are for um, Halloween or fall festival. So I'm not trying to step on any toes here at all. Um, I just know that I've been seeing a lot of signs for um, trunk or treats, um, fall festivals, which our kids have done and they love. But if my priority is mission um, over another religious activity, what I'm I'll let John pick that up with you. Right. I think the the idea, though, is we we enter into the fray. We don't expect the fray to come in this. Yeah. It just doesn't happen. If you and so what happens is you enter in and you become the church outwardly to the fray. But what our idea is, is I'll bring the fray and Pastor John will share the gospel with them. That doesn't actually happen and it doesn't actually work because you are the one that has the relationship with them. You are the one that cares for them and you are the one that will see them again. And so you are the one who has that responsibility. And so I think just thinking that way and saying, okay, how can I use everything? Every single thing. Jesus is in everything. Colossians tells us that. So how can I use every single thing just to continue to push his light into darkness? Yeah. Another circle of um, concentric circle of special interest. Uh, meet people you don't know at the gym. If you go to a gym, if, you go, if you're part of the Rotary Club, if you're part of these special interest um, groups, uh, if you're not part of a special interest group, maybe, think, maybe there's one that you might be interested in getting involved in. And, um, you know, something that's not like um, Christian Grandmothers for Christ, but something that where there it's actually a, a, a where you can actually engage with non-believers. Um, spend time with fringe people on your kids' sports teams. If you do travel ball, most, most um, Christian leaders now are condemning travel ball. Travel ball in itself is not evil. It's, um, it, it could be a great opportunity to be a mission field. Now, it can certainly be an idol as well. Uh, I understand that, but it could also be a place where you are engaging, if you're intentional, 
intentional, intentional, intentional. If you're intentional with engaging with those non-believing parents and children in very meaningful ways uh, of leading them to become disciples, they could be opportunities to really, um, th through those things, to get to know unbelievers. And I think that when you're with those people, they're watching and they're seeing how you interact with your kids, how you interact with your husband. And it's just a great opportunity to s for them to see that and you to say, you know, just to be real about the struggles of that, but then to say, but you know what, I just lean into the Lord and I just cling <laughs> to him because I feel like half the time I'm flying by the seat of my pants in this parenting thing or yeah my husband and I we do not always agree but we have this central focus of Christ and so when we disagree we come back to that and he brings us back together in unity and so I think it just gives those opportunities for them to see that your life is just like theirs and you don't have it all together but then to be able to speak why you are able to come back into um, oneness or why you're able to have that kind of ongoing love relationship with your kids. Yeah. Um, when, when, just one last example from special interest is um, I, when, I was, when we were in China, I really uh, enjoyed, well, I enjoy exercise in general, but I enjoyed kind of, uh, kind of cross-training, um, you know, in the gym some days, out running around the lake some days, um, just exercising different ways. So I, when I would go to the gym, I made it a goal every time I went into the gym that I wanted to meet a different guy. And sometimes it was easy. Sometimes there were, um, there was a couple of guys who actually spoke English, and they approached me. That was an easy day. Some days um, it, it, it was hard. It was like pulling teeth to get someone to talk. But oftentimes uh, I would meet guys, and in the first conversation I would get their WeChat, which is kind of like WhatsApp um, information. Everybody just shares that with everybody in China. I would get their name and their contact and uh, I'll say, let's go out for coffee or a smoothie later. And most of the guys who I invited to do that would, would do that. Mm -hmm. So here, again, it may be that when you're at, at the gym or a place like that, wherever your special interest place is, that you can meet people engaged that way. And I was in an aerobics class in China and, um, for many years and, be and began to teach that class. And so um, we were talking about using holidays. One of the things I did is when it got to be Christmas time, um, my first year of teaching that class, I invited all the ladies in my class to come to my house to have a Christmas party together. And so um, that, and through that, I, obviously, I shared the gospel um, with all of these ladies, about 30 women in my class. And so I think um, as you are exercising or as you are going about your hobbies, maybe you're doing an art class or maybe you're um, in a book club with different people, there are going to be people who are lost and who are hurting and so that is an opportunity. That's another mission field for you to be intentional in. And then to say, hey, you know what? I'm going to open my home and invite you in. And I'm just going to, we're going to celebrate a holiday together through something, through a party or through just a tea or mm -hmm. a dessert. And um, I'm going to just be able to share through that and just being um, intentional again in that way. Yeah. So as we kind of close this section on, tip, on um, getting connected, um, pray that God will give you a true love for others. A couple of weeks ago when I preached here, I preached about the love as the fuel for missions, the motivation for missions. And so pray that God will give you a love for people. If you do all of this, if you try to do all these things and get creative, it sound, may it sound fun, maybe it sounds intimidating, but if you just go out and you just do this because it feels like that's just the thing I should do, you're not going to get very far. This has to be fueled by love for people. Yeah. You will not do this if you do not really love people. Um, see what kind of love the Father's given us, that we should be ch called children of God. And this is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Jesus is our model for sacrificial, incarnational living, coming down, living among us. God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. Jesus came into the world for us to love us. What is the first commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Love for others flows out of a deep, saturated love for God because you experience God so deeply that it just motivates you to love other people. And I was um, preaching this morning at, at Five Points, and I can, this kind of idea came to mind going back to fishing. You know, if you're fishing with a bobber and a, and a hook with live bait, if, you're, if there's any current in the water, when you throw that bobber in the water, um, what, what's going to happen? Your, your ideal fishing spot, that you're aiming for is no longer going to be your spot. That you're going to drift. The bobber's you're going to drop it in. It's going to drift. You'll have to pick the bobber up, put it back um, where you want it to kind of get back to that sweet spot over and over again. Same is true in loving God. If you're going to love 
God and abide in that love of God that fuels this mission that we're talking about, every day you have to replace the bobber in the sweet spot. Put yourself back in the place where you are living constantly in the love of God. Because if you're not living in the love of God, you'll lose motivation or you will continue to do things out of, even maybe you're not motivated, you'll continue to do things, but you're not doing it out of pure motives. And so I just want to say that that's kind of a side note, but, not, but a very important side note as far as motivation, because this, you will drift back to comfort over and over. You'll get out and you'll start living life with the non-believers and you'll start investing in them and then you'll drift back to the center to just hanging out with Northport Baptist friends or just hanging out with the, your family or just the people who are like you. It takes continual coming back to God over and over and praying that he will feel that love for himself and for others. Um, talk to everyone. I've learned this from my wife. Talk to everyone. Even if you're an introvert, figure out ways to start conversations. You'll feel goofy at first, maybe, like I did a few years ago, but talk to everyone. I think that um, that seems intimidating for an introvert, but um, I feel like you can talk about anything. Like, you can just say, um, yeah, like, what time are you getting off work? And, oh, how do you like your job? Or have you had a long day? I mean, those are just, like, of course, that's easy to do. Or um, do you have kids? Like, I mean, your my kids are, like, running around crazy. Do you have kids? I mean, do they do like this, you know, and just start talking about family, start talking, do you, are you married? Start talking about husband. Um, it's always a question. It, it, that's what I was going to say. It starts with a question though, not like, hey, I'm here and I'm going to try to live missionally with you. So I'm going to share the gospel with you. Um, it's not like that. It's like, hey, I'm here and I want to know you. I want to hear your story. And I've got a ton of questions. David actually read a book. What was it called? Um, the question book. No, this was back when I was learning how to talk to people. Uh, again, a very, um, a very much introvert who really needed to learn to talk to people. I read a book called 1001 Conversation Starters. So if you are an extreme introvert, get a book, 1001 Conversation Starters. Um, I, I, or you can just come hang out with me and I will start all these conversations with you. I just, I love asking people questions and I think just become a good question asker. Um, go home and think about all the questions you would like someone to ask you and then go out and ask those questions. That's right. So as we kind of close yeah, well, learn people's names. Uh, actually, that great theologian, Dale Carnegie, taught me years ago when I read How to Win Friends and Influence People, the value of learning people's names, because people, the most important word in a person's vocabulary is their name. And um, I, I went to this, uh, the, the, some guys invited me to a men's Bible study group. There's like 15 or 20 guys in the group. And uh, when I first got there, I didn't only need one or two of them. And, I went, and so b before we got into the, we were meeting at a restaurant and I uh, asked all their names. And when I sat down, I was like, all right, guys, uh, I know this is awkward, but I'm a missionary, excuse me. Um, can I take a picture of all you guys? Because I think I know your names now, but I'm not likely to remember them a week from now. And so, uh, so I, they all kind of stood around, stood behind the table. I took their picture and um, I said, okay, um, let's see, we got Barry, Jay, Sean, uh, Je uh Let's see, Jason, I went around the table and got all of their names. And they're like, wow, how did you remember all these names? I thought, because I've learned that it's important. Mm -hmm. So if you learn people's names, it really is important to them. And that's another gospel bridge. Um, people's names have a lot of biblical heritage. And so, and being in the South, a lot of people name their kids biblical names, even if um, they're not believers, because that's just kind of common in the South. So um, one time, right after we had landed in the States, we were actually in Tennessee quarantining. Um, and uh, I went to Walmart to get some groceries um, in Tennessee, and the man at the checkout line, this is my mission field, right? It's my captive audience. He was um, doing the cash register at that line, and his name was Joseph. Anybody know a story about a man named Joseph in the Bible? I mean, one of the most, um, I think he's one of the, the most allegorical figures in the Bible, right? To, or what do you call it? Like when he is like Jesus, um, the picture of Jesus, foreshadowing. Not allegorical. Sorry, not allegorical. What's Typological. The Typological. Thank you. Um, I'm not a We didn't graduate. tell Joseph about that, by the way. <laughs> we didn't tell Joseph about that, but I was like, um, I was like, oh, there's, do you know where your name came from? And he was like, what? And I was like, your name, Joseph. This, there's this man in the Bible. And I just started to tell him this story about Joseph in the Bible. And I was like, and God saved a remnant of Israel through Joseph. And I was like, 
this is your, like, this is your ancestry. This is your heritage and your name. And, um, and he was like, okay, thank you. <laughs> and so, um, but you know what? It was a plus one. You know what? Because then he's starting to think, wow, my name came from the Bible. And now I've heard this story. And now I know about Jesus and that Joseph was a foreshadowing of Jesus who would save his people. And um, I don't know, I just would say use people's names, use your kids' names. Um, Elijah in China, we used his name all the time because Elijah was a great prophet of God, and he was a spokesperson for God. We used Evie Faith's name. Her name means life of faith. Her Chinese name means that. So we talked about life of faith and Auburn Grace's name. Um, her Chinese name is Grace. And so we just talked about that through our kids' names. So use your own family's names and use their names um, and just share through those as well. Okay. So we're going to um, close the second section. So we talked about get intentional first. We spent about 30 minutes in getting connected. This is our biggest chunk of time that we're dedicating to, to get connected. Because this is what I've learned about um, disciple making uh, or evangelism, what we traditionally call evangelism, is that most people don't really struggle as much in mastering the gospel presentation. Uh, in fact, how many, just raise your hand, how many of you have learned a gospel presentation at some point in your life? Okay, almost every person in the room, if not every person in the room has learned a gospel presentation. If I, if I were to go around and ask you, I would say that probably most of you have forgotten it, unless you just learned it here in the last couple of weeks. Uh, most of you have probably forgotten it, and those who, who actually have learned it, you've probably not used it very much in the last several weeks. Most of the time, I think one of our biggest hang-ups with actually making disciples and getting to the gospel is not learning a presentation. You're all smart people. You can look, we can give you four spiritual laws or um, the bridge, or we can give you these tracks, and you can go home and learn the presentation. Not, it's not where the rub is. The hard part is positioning yourself in relationships with non-believers where, the, where you gain trust with them in a way that you are able to speak the gospel into all areas of life. So... Uh, I want to stop here for just a minute because what we've done for 30 minutes is try to um, give a blueprint or paint a picture of what mission in everyday life looks like. Again, I don't think we've shared anything that is, that is uh, professional, vocational, missionary specific. The, in fact, most of our examples um, were things that we did, have done in Tuscaloosa, not even uh, examples from China. But I want to stop and ask, do you have any um, questions or thoughts that come in, in this section before we move on to the next section, which is getting personal. Can someone grab me a water while, you, before I go on? Okay. What do you think? What, what do you feel when you, he, when you hear this kind of everyday discipleship lifestyle? What, what, does, it, what does it make you feel or, or, or think? Overwhelmed? Excited? Okay. Makes me excited. Does it feel doable up to this point? I mean, is there anybody in the room who feels like uh, I can't talk to my, my friend over coffee or I can't talk? I mean, we can all strike up conversations with people, right? And this, I think, is one of the important parts of uh, the, the most important parts of what we call evangelism which I just call disciple making, I think discipleship and evangelism go hand in hand, is, is just living in life with non-believers. And it is more natural, but it's more, but it's more intentional. It's more demanding. It, it, requ- it requires a shift in the orientation of the way we think. To be honest, most, most of us in, uh, in, in the church, for most of us, it's easier, and we might actually prefer to give uh, $500 to a missionary over having to go out and talk to a non-believing friend or share the gospel with someone ourselves. But God has called every believer to believe, be a disciple maker. All right, I told Scott that this is a two to three hour training. We're doing in an hour and a half. So I'm going to keep moving through the next parts here. So tips for getting connected. Pray that God will give you a true love for other. I've already done that. I'm moving on to the next slide. Get personal. Get personal. You know, it's not, we don't want to just just meet people on the periphery. We want to go deep. We want to get into their lives, into the things that they're concerned about. Uh, on, on the field, 
there's a training that we call uh, the Person of Peace training, and, and, and a lot of uh, mission-focused guys in the States are doing this as well. It comes from Luke 10 and Matthew 10, where Jesus told the 12 and, and the 72 uh, to go out and say, when you go into a new city or to a new home, uh, when you approach that home, say, peace be on this um, house, and if they return that peace to you, then go in and eat with them. If they don't, wipe the dust off your feet and leave. Now, we obviously don't have time to do the whole person of peace training now. But the reason I think that this idea of a person of peace or a house of peace is important is because eventually, if you start living this way, you're going to have lots of non-believers in your life. Um, but you will not be able to invest in every non-believer the same, to the same degree. Okay, let's, let's say that we, over time as a family, we, were, we actually made, re- that made the connection with all 100 houses in Biscayne Hills, uh, if we were here long enough to do that. If we did that, thank you. If we did that, if we made those um, 100 relationships, we couldn't possibly hang out with all 100 people every week on an in depth level. So that's where we enter enters the person of peace. As we're spending time with non believers, there are some people that are going, as we spend time with them, they're going to kind of um, lean in. They're going to be more interested. They're going to reciprocate. Maybe you invite them to your home for, um, for uh, a cookout, and they invite you back to their home to have, to have coffee. Uh, they're people who uh, embrace both you as, as, a, as a person, and usually they're open to your, your message as well. They're, they're, you know, at least they're not pushed off by talking about religious things and these are the people that we're trying to to draw into relationship with and so when you meet these people these um what we call people of peace invite them into your lives and get involved in their lives doesn't mean that you just become exclusive with them but make them the priorities uh, people that you spend time with go to their kids uh, ball games uh, invite them as you to to watch a, a football game at your house those are the people that you're going to um, spend more time with and that you're going to invest in. Um, for me, there was uh, a guy at the gym in China that I, I talked about um, meeting a different guy every day. And I didn't spend a lot of time with every guy, but one of the guys, um, you know, he was just really connected. He was really uh, just interested in me, reciprocated the relationship. And so I would, um, like, inv- like one time I invited him to go uh, four-wheeler ride to rent four-wheelers and ride ride four-wheelers and on that trip I got to um, just to get to know him much deeper level and to um, have uh, gospel conversations with him and that's what it looks like to go deeper with some to get personal to get into the lives of the people um, who draw close and then after you get personal I think that's pretty easy principle to accept that that person the peace thing could be a whole training in itself but after you get connected, what we talked about for 30 minutes, and then you get personal, which means you, you kind of deepen the relationship, get to the heart. Okay, so this is where we're kind of getting into the gospel bridges idea that we got to tonight. Get to the heart. Um, at the root of all sin and struggle is an element of unbelief in who God is and what he's done. Jesus said, the good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good. And the evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil, for out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. There's an idea here that's really important, and a lot of uh, people like Ted and Paul Tripp have capitalized on this, and and they're they're writing about um, parenting. You know, a lot of times we just want to um, to affect the behavior of a child or a lost friend. We we look at their, you know, if we have a, a lost friend, we, we want to just get him to stop drinking or just get him to stop smoking. But what we're really aiming at is is the heart. We want to get to the heart issues, the things that the people uh, that the people that we are in relationships with think about the most. So, for example, when uh, if if my son is is angry is, is angry and he's uh, you know, let's, let's say that he, he hit his sister. You know, our first natural response is we just want to stop the hit. We just want to deal with the hit. But there's something deeper than that that we need to deal with. And it's, it's, the, it's the root of why he hit, why he, why he got angry. There's something that he's not believing about God, that he's not uh, believing to be true of God that may, causes him to do that. And I, I want to show what that looks like. So, again, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. 
So if the fruit of the Spirit out of our hearts flows the fruit of the Spirit, then our hearts are what really needs change. So what, when we're talk about, talking about making disciples, what we're trying to do is to get into conversations about the things that they are really, that's really bothering them, that either that's really bugging them um, on, on the heart level, or the things that they're really excited about. I love this illustration by uh, Jeff Vanderstelt. Um, well, you can see one and a half of it. That's all right. Uh, so if we're not bearing good fruit, there's something wrong with the root. So in this illustration, uh, Jeff Vanderstelt says, um, if you look on the side, it begins with repentance pointing up. Okay, so again, this fruit, uh, the root to fruit idea. What I believe about God, for example, God is love. What I believe about God and what he's done is going to always affect what I believe about who I am and it's going to affect what I do. So look at the example he uses here. If I believe God is love, what did God do to show that he is love? Jesus died for me. He, he died a sacrificial death to demonstrate the love of the Father for me. So who am I? I am, I am radically, sacrificially loved by Jesus. So what does that enable me to do? To love other people. Okay? So on the other hand, if you, want to turn, if, you want to, if you want to look at people's actions and see what it says about their heart, then you turn it upside down. So you say, all right, um, let's, let's, let's take a sin example. So worry um, or, uh, or fear. So if I'm worrying, then first of all, what is that saying uh, that I believe about who I am? It says it, it's saying that I'm not in control. I'm worried. Same thing with anger. I'm not in control of my situation. So what, is it, what does it say I believe about God? It says that I believe that God is out of control. I'm not in control and I should be in this situation. And God is not in control in this situation. So at the root of what I'm believing in my heart is that God is out of control. And so, many, so when we get into conversations with non-believers, I'm going to give some examples of this. I know this is kind of maybe kind of heady at this point. But when we get into conversations with, with our non-believing friends, we're trying to get at the heart of what they are really looking for. What are they looking to satisfy them that only Jesus can satisfy? We want to get to the root of what they are feeling. We want to ask questions that expose the things that they are thinking about, the things that they care about. Because here's the thing with a traditional evangelism presentation, like a tract or an, an apologetic that we might traditionally use. With traditional gospel presentations, uh, if we just give the presentation, we've got to get to the presentation, and I'm, I'm getting there quickly. We've we got to show the presentation, but if we're not showing how, it, how it's relevant to what they're facing in their lives, then they just, it, they just completely miss it. There's a complete disconnect. We've got to first realize how, what they're not believing to be um, true about Jesus, how it is, is affecting them. So asking questions like, how was your week? If you ask somebody how their week is doing, if you ask a cashier how her week is doing, many of them are actually going to tell you. Some might not until you're in relationship with them. But if you ask them, well, my, my, um, my husband left me last week and I'm just devastated by it. Man, you're getting right into the core of what she really cares about. And instead of just talking all the time, I think in, in our gospel, in, in our, in our gospel sharing with other people, we need to take more time to slow and to listen to them and what they're really um, concerned about. Because if we don't, what it, our gospel presentation sounds like a lot of times, it sounds like, it sounds like a sales speech. And it's, and it's uncaring. It's tr just trying to get to accomplish our mission of making our, getting our presentation known. Some people just need us to listen to them and to care for them before we share our message, which we want to absolutely share our message. But sometimes we just need to listen. You know, if I've had people tell me things like that. Um, I had uh, someone was cutting my hair one time and they told me that their um, that their husband left them. Now, if I had said, well, I've got the answer for you. Let me give you let me let me give you four points that will change your life. How well do you think that would be received? Not very well. But I said, tell me about that. I said, that, that must be that must be crushing. Your husband just left. 
I mean, I can only imagine um, how hard that must be. And you've got two children. I mean, and usually they're going to talk. And they're going to talk maybe longer than you expected. But you need to get into their lives. And to, like Jesus did with the Samaritan woman at the well. And, and, and find out what are they really concerned about. An example from, from real life. Um, a few weeks ago, um, my, you know, Elijah, my son, is kind of at an annoying um, stage in his life right now that middle school age boys go through where they just kind of pick. Uh, you know, has anybody ever else had a boy who's done this? They, like, they just kind of pick. I mean, and not just at, at other children, but at everybody. There's, it's just, in fact, <laughs> the last time my son did this, like, like he makes noises, he growls, he pokes. Uh, he, he's not really hurting people, he's just annoying. And I use that language. He's not in the room anymore, by the way. But, he, but one, one night, I just went in and I said, Elijah, I want to tell you why your sister's upset with you. It's not because um, you did some, one thing that was so bad, but because it's just like this. It's just like, just poke. And I just started poking him on the shoulder. I said, you know, it's just like... You know, one poke, that's not a big deal. But what if someone just kept poking and over and over and over and over? And eventually, I about wore a hole in his shoulder and he, stopped and, he, and he asked me to stop. I said, that's what I'm talking about. So my daughter got a little frustrated um, with, maybe angry with her, her brother. And she just gave him a light slap. It, it wasn't bad, but it was enough to make them both angry. And so um, I said... Um, all right, Ag, come, come tell me about this. I said, what, what were you feeling uh, in that moment? Why, why did you want to hit him? He said, I felt angry. And I said, okay, you, you felt angry. Why, why did you feel angry? Well, he did this um, to me, and he, he, was, he was just annoying to me. And, and I said, so in that moment, you were, you were angry. So what, what were you believing about yourself? What were you feeling about yourself? So like, I was just out of control. And like, I, like, I, couldn't, I couldn't stop him. And I said, what, what were you thinking? You know what we believe about God. What do you think that God, what were you feeling about God in that moment through, based on the way that you responded? He said, I guess I was feeling like God wasn't in, in control. God wasn't, wasn't doing anything. And so I, I believe God was out of control, so I took control into my own hands. He said, do you think God was really out of control? No, not really. Um, what did God do to show to, when, what did God do when you were his enemy? Uh, he died for me. Um, that was pretty sacrificial love. Did he strike you back? No, but he could have. He showed you grace, right? Yes, he did. So how do you think you, why do you think you should respond based on what Jesus has done for you? Well, I should be patient with him and not hit him back, even, even if I, I feel angry. I'm like, that's right. Maybe you didn't follow what I was doing there, but I was starting at the top of the tree with all and grace's fruit in that moment, her anger, and I was just working the way down and again, you know, John Scott only gave me an hour and a half. This could be a whole another two hours here. But I was starting at looking at what the, the manifestation of what she was believing, tracing it down to the root, what she was believing about God. And then I'm tracing it back up to what she should believe about God, repentance back up to the right fruit that she should be having. And we can do this not only with Christian in our lives and with Christian children raised in Christian homes, we can do it with non believers. This other um, old guy that I, um, uh, I kind of had an encounter with uh, last week, um, he said something that prob probably somebody in this room has said as well. Um, we were just, we're just kind of shooting, chewing the cud, shooting the breeze, just, just talking. And uh, he said, if Trump doesn't get reelected, America's going to hell. Anybody heard that or something like that? I said, yeah. It, I know, it's, America's looking really bad these days. And, and I said, but, but I wonder, if it, is that true? If Trump doesn't get reelected, is America going to hell? Like, you know, there's been a lot of bad leaders throughout history. I mean, there's been some really bad leaders throughout history. And some bad things have, have happened, but the world never came to an end. We're still here. And I said, I, I'll be honest with you, I, I believe that whatever happens on election day, I, I'm going to vote. I think we should vote. I think we should get involved. But in the end, God is really in control of what happens to America and what happens to the rest of the world. I'm absolutely rock-solid confident of that. But that's, that's what's going to happen. 
I didn't use that as an opportunity to try to get to, to try to get to a to full gospel presentation in the moment. I probably could. But what we're doing every time we enter into these conversations where we're we're kind of letting bubble up what those things are that they're really thinking about. We're using those as opportunities with these non-believers that we're living in everyday life with. And we're creating opportunities where they see what a difference makes when you really, really believe that God is in control of all things, that God really is loving so I don't have to retaliate. It's, they see the difference. And so these are, I'm going to move forward because we're almost out of time. But though we want to get to the root of what they're facing, and though we want to show how Jesus is the answer to that, we've got to get to the gospel. We've got to get to Jesus. This is the last point. We want to get intentional. We want to get connected. We want to draw in deeper. We want to get personal. We want to get to Jesus. And a lot of times we're intimidated by the gospel presentation because we just think of a track to memorize or a presentation to memorize. Really, the gospel is a story. The Bible, the, um, I think last week you kind of talked through some of this from Nicole, but the, the Bible is 66 books that are written by different authors over thousands of years, but it tells one story. And for any of you who uh, maybe are teachers or you are just good students in school, do you remember what the different parts of any uh, novel, of any story are? You've got a conflict. Formally speaking, you've got an exposition, rising action, climax, denouement, conclusion. You've got characters and setting built in there. You've heard those things, right? The gospel story is just that. It's a story with one conflict. If you could say, summarize a conflict of the Bible story in one sentence, what, is anybody brave enough to just give it a stab and what, what you think that, what, that, that conflict is? Thank you. Yes. The missionary had to respond. Come on, guys. Perfect. The story, the conflict of the Bible story, the, the, the conflict that the whole Bible big, big story revolves around is that men are separated from God. You can say because of our sin, if you want to add on at the end. So if that's the story, in the introduction of the story, in the exposition, the introduction, we have, we have people, uh, in a perf- people in perfect relationship, in a perfect place, in relationship with God, The world is just as it should be. But then it enters conflict, and people fall out of relationship with with God, and you only get two pages, and maybe depending on the size of your Bible, two pages into the story where you have the central um, conflict where Satan comes, and obviously uh, men, uh, people sin, they fall out of relationship with God, and then you've got thousands of years of history and thousands of pages of Bible writing um, until you get to the climax where the rescuer comes. He comes into our story and he makes a way to, to, um, to correct the, con- the, pro- the main problem, the conflict. And Jesus comes and he is the solution to the problem so that we can have a relationship with God. And Jesus rescued us. And at the end of the story, at the conclusion of the story, all things are going to be restored, made right. That's the gospel story. You can say it even shorter than that. If I, if I wanted to just do the most basic gospel outline, I could say it like this. I want to tell you a story about the Bible's, the, the, the story that the whole Bible is all about. At the beginning of time, God created all, God created the first man and woman. He put them in a garden and they were in perfect relationship with himself. The, um, the, the, the world in which he created them to live in under his rule was perfect. There was nothing wrong. But just right after the story um, started, they disobeyed God and they fell out of relationship with him. There's nothing in history that's ever been more tragic than the fact that people have been uh, falling out of relationship with God. After thousands of years, God sent a rescuer into the world and he rescued men by giving them a way that they could come back and have a relationship with him. And the good news is the story's not over yet. Though we can now have a relationship with God, there's going to be a day when he's going to make everything like it was back in the beginning. That's the gospel message. And that's the gospel message that we present to all people. Now, maybe you were hoping that we'd spend more time on that and on how to develop that. But I very intentionally, uh, I had a video, a five-minute video clip called The Story that um, we can pass on. You can watch it later. I think it's a good summary of that in five minutes with video that you can give to your friends. We don't have time to do it tonight. But the reason I intentionally 
didn't spend a lot of time on the presentation is because I don't think that's where you struggle. I want to challenge you tonight. I want to encourage you to think about how do you need to reorient your life so that you're, you're thinking like a missionary, you're living like a missionary, and the everyday things of life. I'm not asking you to add on anything to your life at this point. Just in the everyday things that you do in life, how can you think more intentionally about living in, in relationship with non-believers? And as you're in relationship with them, seeking out ways and conversations, uh, how to have conversations with them, not through trickery, not through bait and switch tactics, but just in the process of normal conversation, finding out the things that they're really struggling with and wrestling with, the ways they're looking for fulfillment outside of Christ, and then showing them in very natural ways, in the context of relationship, how they can know Jesus. One thing I want to say before I finish is I think, the, I think these are the normal rhythms of life where people, truly non-believers, truly unchurched, are going to be most likely to be engaged with the gospel and see real life change. I don't want to, I'm not saying that you shouldn't share the gospel sometimes on the first meeting of someone. Sometimes you're going to meet someone for the first time and you, you, you may not see them again. Share the gospel with them on the first time. In China, every time I took a taxi, if it was a five-minute taxi ride or an eight-minute taxi ride, I would, sh- I would um, get to the gospel as quickly as I could, share with that person, because I didn't know if I would ever see them again. So most of what we talk tonight is just everyday life. I'm not saying that you shouldn't share the gospel. I'm not saying that you shouldn't give tracts. But I think what we see as a biblical model from the believers who spread from Jerusalem and went out is that in the everyday, um, just the everyday life, they were out telling people about Jesus. Everywhere they went, they were living in community, telling other people about Jesus. And I just want to encourage you in that tonight. It does take a mindset, a, a shift in your way of thinking. But I think this is what God has called us to. If we want to really not simply just make converts, just get people to come to church one time, but to really make disciples of people who follow Christ.